My name is Chris Norris. I'm the Senior Collection Manager for Vertebrate Paleontology at the Peabody Museum of Natural History, which is part of Yale University. This is a video interview which is part of a series called Voices About the Future that's being put together by the Center for the Future of Museums, which is part of the American Association of Museums. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Britain in the 70s, museum exhibits were very different to how they are today. There were very few interactives, there were certainly no video screens, and the idea that um, a visitor might come into an exhibit, uh, have ideas about that exhibit, record those ideas, and have those ideas in some way accessible to other visitors through the exhibit, would have been completely unthinkable. As far as museums were concerned, they were the guardians of the truth, and the delivery of the truth was a one-way process by which the museum dumped information onto the visitor. Now that's not true. We live in a world full of user-generated content like blogs and wikis um, and social networking sites and people are used to being able to interact with and change information and I think that museums are going to have to increasingly do that in the future. The other thing that's changed a lot since I was a kid is that you no longer have to leave your house to go and visit a museum. Um, you can do, um, you can experience museums and their collections uh, quite easily without ever leaving your armchair. That's something that again would have been unthinkable when I was a, a child and indeed probably would have been unthinkable even 10 years ago which only goes to show what a risky business it is trying to predict the future. How will changes in society affect museums? Well one way is that um, our expectations about our role uh, in terms of reaching out to uh, people in society that are perceived as being excluded in some way are going to have to change. Uh, many of the groups of people that we define as being excluded from the museum experience, um, for example on the basis of their ethnicity, are actually going to be in a majority in the population in 25 years time. Um, I think we're going to have to step away from the rather paternalistic attitude that um, visiting museums is one of the characteristics of a well-rounded and well-educated member of society and move to a position where we start thinking about um, and justifying our role in terms of society. Um, can we really say that museum visitation is important if most people in society don't actually do it? Another thing we're going to have to grapple with is the difference between the virtual and the real and the role of the virtual versus the role of the real in museums. We already have museum collections that exist solely as virtual items. A good example of this would be the astrophysics collection at the American Museum of Natural History. This is a collection of data. You run a, a multi-day com computer simulation of, say, two galaxies colliding. Uh, you generate an enormous amount of data which you put a catalogue number on and you store in your collection. Uh, it's a specimen, but it's not an object in the way that we would uh, normally recognise a museum object. Now, in my own field, paleontology, we already have the technology to uh, use laser scanners to capture three-dimensional data about museum specimens like fossils. We can then take that data, we can feed it into a 3D printer or milling machine and produce uh, an exact replica or an almost exact replica of the fossil um, at any scale that we want. Now this technology is only going to get better and it's only going to get cheaper. Um, in the not too distant future I'm sure we'll be able to capture information about very fine features of the fossil including little nerve openings and, uh, and the junctions between bones um, <coughs> and we may even be able to capture information about the colour um, and the fine texture of the object. And you could imagine a situation in 25 years time where you sitting at home could go to a museum's website or whatever exists in the form of websites 25 years from now and download a package of data and on your own 3D printer produce uh, an exact replica of a fossil or other museum object that you can hold in your hand. So you have a virtual experience which you can actually hold. And that raises all sorts of interesting questions. One of them is, um, well, okay, we're always going to go out and collect new specimens because we always want to know new things and this is one way that we do it. But if we can capture those specimens as digital information and store them much more cheaply as digital information and make them much more widely available as digital information, what value do we put on the real thing? And are we prepared to invest money in storing and looking after the real thing? There's also a question about the future role of museums as the source of authoritative information. 
We've already got used to the fact that people can generate um, their own information and make that information available, um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, many people use Wikipedia, and it's not the end of Western civilization, despite what some people say. For the museums, the challenge is defining how people um, fulfill that role in respect of museum displays and um, collections information. Obviously, it's a good thing to have people interact with and participate in and get some degree of ownership over the collections that are part of their common cultural property. The challenge for us is in defining the rules and parameters so that they're not too oppressive and that they don't dissuade people from participating, but that at the same time um, we filter out the more egregiously inaccurate, unpleasant or otherwise bad information. And that's a tricky challenge for museums and it's something that we need to be addressing now. As far as the future economy of museums and the economy of museum funding, I think a lot of the challenges are going to revolve around this issue of virtual versus real. If you can experience a museum remotely via the web, then should museums be paying for expensive public galleries um, which have high staffing costs and high operating costs? Um, could you conceive of a situation, for example, where a museum consists solely of a collection and all of the uh, public outreach and public education and public access components is done via the web? Such a thing could well exist. It probably does exist already. Um, and it would be, in some respects, significantly cheaper, in many respects significantly cheaper, than a conventional museum. Um, so that's certainly a challenge for the future and it's not something that collections people should feel smug about because as I said earlier on, what happens if you can capture objects digitally and store them digitally? Does that then mean that you go back and reconsider whether you actually want to go to the expense and effort of storing and retrieving and making accessible the actual physical objects in the collection? Couldn't you just do this remotely by the transfer of data as I suggested earlier on? Finally. Um, the question that I've been asked to address is um, what can museums do to maintain the public trust? Um, and I think that that's, a, that's an interesting question, um, particularly in the light of current events. And, and if I, there's one thing that I want to highlight which is, uh, which is, is particularly true given all of uh, the, the ongoing economic crises, it's that people should have an expectation when they give something to a museum for the purpose of sharing it with wider society that the museum will go to the wall financially before it sells that object on the open market. Um, I think that's something that museums have to do and plainly at the moment some museums are not doing. And The more they do this, the more they blur the line between not-for-profit and profit and actually compromise public trust. Anyway, thank you for letting me talk to you for a little bit about my prejudices. Bye now.